How is it that even decades after its release, people still manage to praise Ocarina of Time as one of the greatest games ever? I mean, how good could a 20th century title on the Nintendo 64 really be? After all, with all the hardware restrictions, games could only ever get so big or look so good, so why do we still praise it today? A lot of this, as you might assume, is largely tied to nostalgia, but there are actually many things that the game does right out of the gate in order to captivate its audience, and a lot of those things still hold up years later. Ocarina of Time's epic story is one of its most memorable aspects, and even before players are presented with any kind of lore or dialogue, the game already sets a strong tone using just its intro sequence. The whole scene has a somewhat calming tone to it, but especially through the use of the visuals, it manages to still give you an overall feeling of the bigger adventure that is to come with this game. And once you've actually started your game, you'll get another cutscene, this time with a little bit of exposition. You learn about a boy with no fairy and the nightmares that he's been having. You get to see a little bit of Ganondorf, which will be a cutscene that you actually participate in later on. And then we immediately see the Deku Tree and Navi, and that leads to Navi being introduced to the character, and then the game effectively starts from there. The game shows off a lot of the forest and a lot of its NPCs right away as they're showing you this first cutscene. And all that's basically just to hype you up to explore and go and talk to these people and interact with the world, all of which will of course lead to different paths within the forest. At this point, the game will start to show its age a little bit, as it keeps reiterating the same point to you as if you weren't smart enough to figure it out yourself. Again, the expository cutscene at the beginning tells you to go to the Deku Tree. The cutscene with Navi tries to further entice you to explore beyond that. And then once you've actually gained control of your character, the first thing that happens as you leave your house is another character that's being introduced to you comes up to you and tells you once again to go to the Deku Tree. All the NPCs in the forest basically just talk to you in tutorial speak. Press A to do this, use control stick to do that, you know. Either way, the environment is colorful and vibrant, and it's actually really fun to run around and explore. You can pick things up, you can roll around, you can talk to people. And once you get your sword and shield, which are necessary to progress in the story and go see the great Deku tree, you have the newly added combat dynamic to play around with, letting you cut grass and just run around and do green kit stuff. This all helps to gradually ease you into the basic mechanics of the game, and once you finally make it to the Deku Tree, you're thrust into your first dungeon. The dungeons are easily the backbone of the game, and they will continuously challenge a player's resourcing and problem-solving skills. For as little as there was to do within the Kokiri Forest and the Lost Woods if you were able to make your way through there, there isn't exactly a lot to test the player on at this point. But especially with it being the first dungeon not only of Ocarina of Time, but of 3D Zelda in general, the Deku Tree will test your ability to understand the verticality that the game uses for its dungeon design. You should already know to climb your way up, and as you do, Navi will give you some advice and you'll find the first item of the dungeon being the map. The map of course just makes the dungeon a little easier to navigate, but it's just a little goodie to reward you on your way to the actual dungeon item being the slingshot. There's also a giant hole that's made very obvious to you in the center of the ground that leads to another lower section of the dungeon, but figuring out how to get down there is, of course, the first obstacle that you're going to face in this dungeon. Not exactly the most difficult thing in the world to figure out, but again, this is basically just a tutorial not only checking you on what you've learned up to this point, but also establishing the patterns that you will see throughout the rest of the game. You will see this recurring pattern of go to dungeon, get item, kill boss over and over again with the game, and that might seem a little repetitive, but considering that these items have to actively be earned by overcoming whatever challenge the dungeon initially throws at the player, as opposed to just have it being given to the player outright, they never really feel too forced, it never feels artificial. And more so than that, it helps these items transcend being just resources and serving as legitimate rewards as well. You still get a lot of tutorial speak for a lot of things that seem like they would be very obvious and self-explanatory, things like opening doors, pushing rocks, or pressing a button to climb up something. But again, with this being the first 3D Zelda, and with 3D gaming still being a pretty new thing at the time, I guess they just didn't want to worry about people, especially young kids getting wrapped up in that third dimension and not knowing how to traverse a game when all they've known up to this point was just a flat 2D plane. Anyway, there isn't a whole lot that happens in this dungeon besides that. You encounter your first few enemies like Skultulas and then some of the Deku Babas that you would have already seen outside. 
You get some of those talking Deku scrubs, which I guess just serve as further tutorials. And you get introduced to a little bit of every basic mechanic just to make sure that you know it later on. There's a little bit of water traversal, diving, stepping platforms, eyeball switches, and pretty much everything else that you'll see throughout the game. Burning parts of the environment are an obstacle you'll see throughout the game as well, but full-on destructible objects aren't introduced as a concept until later. Every major dungeon and temple in the game has a final boss, all of which are visually distinct, serving as visual representation of their respective dungeon, but they all serve the same effective purpose of giving the player a little bit of combat and showing off the fancy new graphics of the time. The child bosses all seem to have an emphasis on reinforcing the basic mechanics and principles behind the items that you got from their dungeons, but the later bosses for the Adult Link segments all play a more active role in fleshing out the story and even carrying out a little bit of lore themselves. The bulk of which gets dished out during that intro segment as well as right after this first dungeon whenever you're talking to the Deku Tree right before you get the first spiritual stone. You're told to go to Hyrule Castle so you can talk to Princess Zelda and on your way out of the forest you get the Fairy Ocarina from Saria. With the game being named after the Ocarina of Time itself, the item is obviously going to play a big role in it, but they couldn't give you the actual Ocarina of Time right from the beginning because of obvious story and game progression reasons. This soon after is very heavily reinforced, as Impa teaches you Zelda's lullaby which is necessary to make basically everything happen across all of Hyrule. It's actually necessary to complete the first two dungeons as you can't access them without playing Zelda's lullaby for the respective NPCs, whereas the adult segments or just later segments of the game in general have a variety of songs that you can use in order to get different interactions. Some of these are just side stuff, but most of them are relevant to the story or accessing temples or something similar. Really, it's just fancy fast travel music. Nonetheless, I think it's all pretty well implemented. The songs themselves serve not only as a way to set up each temple's theme, but they also reinforce the strong themes of music that the entire game revolves around. And since you're bound to travel to these locations for one reason or another, even if you're not following the main story in particular, you will either learn of the songs from the main story, or you'll stumble upon them and they will give you some sort of insight as to what you're supposed to do to progress the story from that point. And this once again just all plays back into that same cycle of reiterating the same point to the player over and over again. Even at this point, the game is so insistent on holding your hand through the whole experience that Sheik doesn't even let you leave the Temple of Time so you can explore Hyrule as an adult without letting you know exactly where you should be going. You interact with Sheik as soon as you come out of the Sacred Realm as Adult Link. You get a little more lore, you're prompted to go to the Lost Woods. At which point she intercepts you again, gives you a little more lore, teaches you your first fast travel song. You'll still get the same old expository stuff, but you'll almost always have to do something in between talking to Sheik, learning the song, and then actually going into the temple. Which itself gives these songs an immediate sense of usefulness because you'll go and do that thing and then you'll want to use the fast travel song to come right back to the temple and actually get it over with. The temples that you play through as an adult have a greater emphasis on ambience since they don't have to waste any time teaching you how to solve them. But you will still just be seeing more of the same obstacles you've seen in the dungeons up to this point. The added challenge then as a don't link comes from the way that the temples incorporate their design into making reaching and interacting with these obstacles that much more intriguing and difficult. At the end of the day, you're still just lighting every torch, or stepping on a switch, or killing all the enemies in a room, but the way that players are forced to interact with the actual temples themselves now, make doing those simple things more challenging than ever. It's still the same old structure of finding the item in the dungeon and using it to clear out what's left of the dungeon, but again, with the more intricate design that the temples have overall, figuring out exactly when or how you're supposed to use that item becomes a greater part of the challenge overall. Calling back to that giant hole in the middle of the Deku Tree, it's clear that this whole idea of incorporating the dungeon's design into the challenge that it provides the player has been present from the very beginning, though where the Deku Tree used its verticality to incorporate a momentum puzzle to have you break into the basement of the dungeon, most other segments that use these sorts of physics as part of their puzzles or their challenge just use movement and verticality as a way to try to disorient you while you're trying to shoot a target or light something on fire. The introduction of boss keys in the adult segments also means that that's one more thing you're going to have to look for in the temple, 
and mini bosses or just mini boss sort of encounters become more commonplace as a way of keeping you from just walking into the items chamber and getting the item you need to clear the dungeon. Most of these are kind of mediocre, they're just like gauntlet style battles with a handful of NPCs, but in some cases you get really interesting bosses, like in the water temple where you get to fight Darkling. The water temple is also probably the only adult temple that really encompasses the idea of verticality in the same way that the early dungeons did, in particular once again the Deku Tree. Every dungeon and temple in the game definitely takes advantage of having multiple floors. But only a couple of dungeons, like the fire and water temples, feel like all of those floors are actually interconnected. In particular, the water temple has a central chamber that spans across three floors, and depending on the current water level within the temple, the status of those rooms and what the player can do within those chambers and where those chambers might lead to all changes, so you have to be aware of not only where these rooms are and what was in them, but whether or not you needed the temple to be underwater or if you needed that room to be dry at that given moment or whatever else. On top of being a little bit confusing, the whole temple overall is more grueling and tedious because if you make any little mistake, you're bound to have to traverse through half the temple once again in order to change the water level, get to where you need to go to change the water level again, and this time hopefully go in the right direction that you should have gone the first time. If that all wasn't bad enough already, the only way to navigate through the water is by equipping or unequipping the iron boots in the pause menu. So each time you need to go into one chamber or another through the water, or if you make a mistake and have to go back again, you're gonna have to pause and unpause and pause and unpause multiple times just to go up and down the water to traverse back to where you need to be. The rest of the temples for Adult Link feel very much the same. It's just more abstract, more complicated design for the temples. And then just figuring out how to navigate the temple and get to where you need to go to hit your switch, open your door, etc. But you will still see the introduction of a couple of minor mechanics as you get more dungeon items and equipment. The hookshot would have introduced the concept of zipping to one place or another or even bringing objects to yourself. Whereas things like the bow and arrow and the megaton hammer would have added dynamics to mechanics you already understand like destroying objects or shooting targets. Wearable equipment such as the hover boots or the mirror shield however grant you new and highly unique mechanics, like walking on air or being able to reflect beams of light, but outside of maybe one or two instances, these newly introduced mechanics aren't very useful and they're never really expanded upon outside of their respective temples. The Gerudo training grounds allow these mechanics to shine a little more than they would have normally, but that's all just for the sake of unlocking some more equipment anyway. The ice arrows themselves being kind of unnecessary alongside the fire arrows. Even the light arrows that you get towards the very end of the game are only useful for lore reasons. Mechanically, it's just another variation of the bow and arrow. Once you have beaten every temple and freed their respective sages, you will have collected all of the medallions, allowing you to return to the Temple of Time where you'll be finally reunited with Princess Zelda, where she gives you a final lore dump right before being kidnapped by Ganondorf and taken to Ganon's castle. The castle itself is split into segments, each representing one of the adult temples. Each of these segments are comprised of puzzles that call back to those original temples or a related environment like the ice cavern or the bottom of the well. But they all just lead to the same sort of chamber where you have to shoot a source of energy with your light arrow so that the sages can help you bring down the barrier around Ganon's tower. Once the barrier's down and you go into the tower itself, you'll hear the organ music start playing and you'll make your way up the stairs to finally encounter Ganondorf and start the final battle. The first phase of which is basically just like the Phantom Ganon boss fight from the Forest Temple, only without the magic paintings, with the main difference being that you have to take him down with the light arrows before you start beating on him with your sword. Killing him triggers a cutscene in which Ganondorf will ultimately start bringing the castle down. You get a timer as you have to make your way out of the castle and you'll run into a few boss style or mini boss style encounters on your way out to keep things from being a little more interesting than just running from one room to the next. And upon finally escaping the tower, you'll trigger a final cutscene in which it all collapses down into the ground and from the rubble, Ganondorf flies back up, reveals the Triforce, and the final encounter with Ganon begins. Which while Ganondorf as a character wasn't introduced until Ocarina of Time, Ganon has been the main antagonist from the very beginning. 
This game does a good job of encapsulating everything that it's done to keep the player's interest up to this point, both in terms of mechanics as well as the lore and the story overall. Ganon's whole stature, the environment, the darkness, the fire, it's all very intimidating. It's very cinematic. The music is very intense. And this new, truer form that Ganon has finally revealed acts as a sort of embodiment of not only everything that Ganondorf represents as a story antagonist, but also the full power that Ganondorf possesses as well as the power of the Triforce itself. The fight ends with Link driving the Master Sword through Ganon's skull and Zelda alongside the six sages sealing him into the Sacred Realm. He swears his revenge as he's getting cast away, and soon after we transition to a final cutscene with Zelda where we get our last bit of lore, and she basically just reiterates the game to you in a brief little exposition, all the while acknowledging that running away and doing all this time travel stuff may not have been the best solution to the problem that Ganondorf posed to Hyrule to which her solution was doing even more time shenanigans and sending us back in time once more to prevent Ganondorf from ever rising to power at all. Which that act in and of itself leads to a completely separate timeline for Hyrule. So alongside the Hyrule that we've now seen as Adult Link where everything is destroyed, there is now also this completely separate timeline where Ganondorf never rose to power that stems from Zelda sending us back in time to this different childhood at the end of the game with the Ocarina of Time. Crazy timeline nonsense aside, I think you'll feel more than satisfied and rewarded after everything is said and done regardless of how much extra stuff you might have done if you did side questing for other special items or if you just ran around and explored the different locations to your liking. You won't have regretted your time with this game. The strong story hooks you in right away, especially with the cool visuals, the cinematics, and a lot of the sound effects that it uses. Again, going back to that intro, it's really dramatic from the beginning. And it just keeps taking advantage of these things to keep you interested not only at the active level with all the gameplay and with the puzzles that you have to solve, but also at the subconscious level just with all the nice dings and all the sound effects, as well as the ambience, the music, and everything else working together. It sets a pretty high standard from the beginning and I think it maintains it throughout the entirety of the game. You always have the ambience and your sense of immersion to fall back on with a game like this. And as you explore, either because you were prompted to or just because you're curious, you find different and more unique ways to interact with the world, which leads to more secrets, which leads to more rewards, which leads to more ways that you can interact with the world, so on and so forth. And that whole interaction with the world is basically what the temples are built upon. You need to know exactly how to navigate through the temples themselves and how the mechanisms within enable you to do so. Even if it's not the most complex stuff in the world, it does make you think about it sometimes, and you do feel smart, you do feel rewarded for figuring it out. And even when one of these dungeon items doesn't really let you explore in new and creative ways, again calling back to the fire and ice arrows, sometimes it's just nice to have a different way to press buttons. It's nice to have different visuals and sound effects, or it's nice to be able to kill an enemy with one less hit. And when those items are the reward for some optional task that you feel like you discovered on your own, the satisfaction that comes from using these items is much greater than the ones that come from the explicit dungeon items. It's kind of like when you stumble upon a cool new YouTube channel and decide you actually want to click on the annotations and hang around until the end tag so that you can see what else we're doing and then you feel rewarded when it's actually good content and it's just like, man, I'm going to watch this channel every day from now on. I mean, at least if it would be cool if you did. I would make more stuff like this if you do.